Okay, we're going to jump into empowering your core for ministry. And this is how to turn an audience into an army. Uh, remember, the goal is to reach out into the community through evangelism, attract a crowd to worship, and then uh, build up uh, the, uh, the committed, or no, <laughs> if I don't do this in the right sequence, I get all mixed up. So I reach out into the community uh, through evangelism, attract a crowd to worship, I build up the congregation uh, through uh, discipleship, and then I train them, uh, train them for ministry, and then I send them out on evangelism. And I do it all for the glory of God. This is the most important part. You, know, you really want to get to this part. You're doing it all for the glory of God. So um, a Gallup survey in the United States found out that only 10% of all laymen were active in ministry. So only 10% of the people were active in ministry in the church. But, uh, and the survey found out that 50% had no interest at all. So half the people in the congregation had no interest in serving, being involved in ministry. But 40% said that they wanted to be involved, but they'd never been asked or they didn't know how. Okay? So imagine being able to, rather than having only 10% of your congregation involved, imagine mobilizing another 40% so that half the people in your congregation are plugged in and are serving. And so uh, that's the goal of uh, empowering your core for ministry. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, in my church, we have about 1,250 that come to the weekend services. And about 200, and, uh, over 200 of those are kids. So we've got about 1,000 adults that are showing up to our services every weekend. And we have... Uh, 450 people who are involved in what we call our dream team. We got 450 people who are actively involved in our ministries. So we've got uh, almost 50% of our congregation involved in serving. That's really a high number in our culture. And I, I, don't, I don't know how that applies for you here, but I, wanna, uh, I do want to tell you the, the biblical basis for lay ministry and introduce you to a process of how you can move more and more people into those <laughs> ministry positions. So first, uh, you want to have a class. You have what we call the 301 class, the ministry class. Our church, we call it step three. And there you want to teach the biblical basis for lay ministry. And uh, Romans 12, 1 through uh, 8 gives us the four pillars of lay ministry. And in that passage, uh, we learn that every believer is a minister. Okay? The pastor is not the only, only one who's the minister. Uh, every believer is to be uh, serving, uh, involved in ministering. You know, it's every part of the body functioning together. That, that's the goal. Second, every ministry is important. Uh, you know, it, what happens on the platform is not more important than what happens uh, in the children's ministry or even in, in any other ministry. You know, there, there's a difference between importance and prominence, okay? And so in the church, we have some ministries that are very prominent. They're very upfront, they're very noticeable. But that doesn't mean that, that, that they're really even the most important. Same's true, you know, that the church is a body, well, the same is true with my body. You know, if you look at my body, uh, my nose is very prominent. Uh, my, my nose is very apparent. I mean, one of the first things you see when you see me is you see my nose just sticking right out there. Okay? <coughs> my nose is very prominent. My nose is not really very important. Truth is, I, I, could, I could live a, a long, full, happy life if you just lopped off my nose. I mean, I wouldn't look as handsome as I do now. Or maybe I'd look better. But uh, it, it's, I'm not going to lose my life if I lose my nose. But there are parts of my body that you will never see. I have a, I have a pancreas in here in my body. It's about the size of my little finger. And I, I, I'll never see my pancreas. You'll probably never see my pancreas. I mean, it's just not, it's not prominent. It's not apparent. But it is extremely important. I can't live without it. In fact, if I lose it, uh, you know, I'll, I'll die shortly thereafter. 
So there's a big difference between what's important and apparent and, and, and what, uh, or what's prominent and apparent versus what's important. And the same is true in the church. There are lots of ministries that happen in the background that are very, very important for your church. Prayer ministries, uh, you know, uh, j just the uh, administrative stuff that happens, uh, the, the counseling that goes on behind the scenes, uh, those things are very, very important. So you want to give credence to every ministry in your church. You want, you want to recognize the importance of every ministry. Uh, next, we are dependent on each other. Uh, that, that's the whole message of Romans 12 there is just the fact that we are a body and the body parts can't function without all the other body parts. And so we see that ministry is the expression of my shape. And shape is uh, an, an acrostic acronym here for spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, and experiences. And so these five things make up my shape uh, for ministry. And so what you want to do is you want to establish a ministry placement process that is uh, based on that shape. Uh, everybody in your church has spiritual gifts. They all have a heart, heart for ministry, different ministries that they want. Some people love to work with kids. Some love to work with teens. Some love to work with uh, the poor, some love to work with those who are ill. I mean, they've got a, a heart for ministry, different types of ministry. Uh, you've got abilities. Uh, some people are really good with numbers. Some people are really good with people. Some people are really good uh, uh, with uh, crowds. Some people are really good one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, they're good with mechanics. They're good with uh, uh, tech kind of stuff. So whatever abilities people have, you want to use those. Uh, there are different types of personality in your church. Uh, you know, some people are uh, extroverts, very outgoing, love to be uh, in front of people, love to be around a lot of people. Some people are introverts, very shy. Uh, they don't want to deal with many people. Uh, you know, some people are, uh, like to be in charge. Some people like to have people give them directions, tell them what to do, give me the instructions, and I'll follow them. And so you want to discover what kind of personality that someone has. And then you've got life experiences that you can tap into that help people, uh, that, that prepare them for ministry. And that you may have uh, educational experiences, you may have vocational experiences, different places people have worked, you may have spiritual experiences, uh, things that have happened to them, maybe at a camp or a retreat or from a sermon, uh, you know, part of their spiritual journey. And then we also have painful experiences. And what, what we've discovered at our church is God never wastes a hurt. And your most effective ministry is probably going to come out of your most painful life experiences. I mean, who better to help a, a parents who've just lost a young child than other parents who've lost a child and found Christ faithful? You know, who better to help that widow than other widows who've lost their husband and found Christ faithful? Who better to help that guy who's just lost his job than somebody else who's lost their job and found Christ faithful? You know, it, it, it's our, our painful experiences that prepare us to, to offer God's grace and minister to, to other people. So we want to tap into those spiritual experiences. So in your 301 class, you want to teach people the concept of ministry fact that uh, we're all part of a body, every ministry is important, and, uh, uh, and the other uh, principles of that, you want to also then help them discover their shape, help them discover their spiritual gifts, uh, their heart, their abilities, their personality, and their experiences. And in our 301 class, we actually take people through a spiritual gifts test that helps identify the spiritual gifts that they have. We take them through a personality uh, inventory to help them discover what type of personality they have. We help them identify uh, what their heart for ministry is, what, uh, what kind of people do they like to minister to, and, uh, and we help them come up with a complete shape profile. And that's step two in, in this process. And then step three is, is we want them to make a commitment to ministry. And um, uh, we want them to step up and say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to get plugged into the ministry. I'm going to serve in a way that, that helps build up this church. 
And then the, the step four in that process is, is they meet with a, a ministry guide and they look at the various ministries that we have in our church and they pick out a couple of three possibilities of where they might fit. And uh, we have 16 what we call dream teams at our church. And uh, that's everything from uh, the admi administrative team uh, all the way down to our usher team. And there's a, a kids team, a student team, a small group team, a greeter team, usher team, a cleaning ministry team, a security team. I mean, we've just any ministry that we've got at the church, we've created a team for it. tech team, setup team, uh, our building maintenance team. And, and so we've got all these different teams. And then when people go through our class process, we help them find out, okay, this is the team that would be best for you to, to serve on. And then we connect them with the leader of that, of that team, and they talk through a, a, about an onboarding process of how they can get plugged in. Is there training that they need, something they need to learn? Uh, what are the requirements of the team? And then they start showing up, and they begin to, to serve uh, in that ministry. Um, we, we make a real effort to acknowledge and recognize our dream team people. And uh, we actually have shirts that we give them, we, have, uh, we throw a party for them, we have a huddle for them every week uh, in our service, uh, we have special snacks for them, and uh, we do whatever we can to, to elevate and honor the people who are, who are on, our, uh, on our ministry teams. But number three, in order to, to move people into those positions, you've got to streamline your organizational structure to maximize ministry and minimize maintenance. And by maintenance here, we mean minimize meetings. Uh, you know, that's the kind of maintenance that we're talking about. Uh, you, you've got to reduce the number of meetings and you've got to increase the, the amount of ministry that's actually happening. You know, people don't want to volunteer to work if they're just going to wind up sitting in a meeting. Uh, people want to volunteer to work because they want to see things happen. They want to, they want to be involved in something that's making a difference. So number four, we, we provide on-the-job training. Uh, you know, we don't wear them out with pre-service training. We, people don't have to be uh, able to do the job perfectly in order to be able to do the job. And so we'll, uh, you know, a lot of times with our greeters, we'll have them greet with uh, an experienced greeter, our children's classes, they'll come alongside and work with somebody who's experienced, but we quickly get them plugged in and get them doing what, uh, what they signed up to do. It's just more fulfilling and it's also more <laughs> beneficial for us. Uh, you never start a ministry without a minister. Uh, the most critical factor in a new ministry startup is not the idea, but the leadership. So you never start a ministry without a leader. Everything rises and falls on leadership. And so, l listen, ideas are, are a dime a dozen. Everybody's got ideas about things the church ought to be doing. And just because somebody has an idea about what should be doing, the church should be doing doesn't mean they're the one who should be doing it. You know, they may not be good at it. They may not have the ability. They may not be a good leader. And so you don't have to act on every idea that somebody comes up with. But what you want to do is you want to try and find a leader for every, uh, every ministry. And the um, truth is most small churches try to do too much too soon. And you might find yourself being more effective if you went home and actually eliminated some ministries that don't have a leader or don't have a strong leader. So we, we, we just have the, the rule at our church, we get a great idea, we've got a ministry we want to start, but we don't have the leader then we just recognize, God, we're not ready. And we just start praying, God, bring, bring us the leader uh, that we need in order for this ministry to happen. And that really when the leader shows up, that's, that's the sign that it's God's time to do it. And he may be preparing you, he may be preparing the church, he may be preparing the groundwork for the ministry, but it's not ready till the, leader, till the leader's there. Uh, you want to establish minimum standards and guidelines. You, you don't want to uh, bury people with procedures and policies and, and paperwork. Uh, you just want to uh, uh, determine what, what's the minimum that we need here in order to get people started, in order to help them to do this. Uh, at, at Saddleback and at our church, anybody can start a new ministry. 
uh, as long as they follow four ministry guidelines. One, they don't expect the staff to run it. In other words, if you come up with the idea, uh, you're it. You know, and, and if you're not it, if you can't lead it, then you need to help us find a leader uh, to do it. But it's not a matter of the church coming up with all these ideas of what the staff needs to do. It's a matter of, uh, of if you come up with the idea, that means you've got the heart for it, then let's find out if God's made, given you the shape uh, to do it. Uh, number two, the ministry is compatible with our church's strategy and philosophy. Does it fit in uh, with the purpose-driven model? Does it fit in with what we're trying to do to reach our target? Does it uh, create... The, the kind of atmosphere that we want to create as a church. And number three, the ministry will not harm the testimony uh, of the church. You know, it's going to be done in such a way that it honors God and, uh, and isn't uh, insulting to people. And you don't do any fundraising. Uh, you know, you don't want to have ministries that wind up uh, begging for money from, uh, from the people in the church. If it's a ministry of the church, it needs to be funded by the offerings that come into the church. It needs to be built into the budget of the church. Uh, you want to allow people to quit or change ministries gracefully without guilt. You know, if, if somebody gets started on a ministry and they realize, oh, I really don't like this or I, I can't do this or it's not working out, that's fine. You, you want to give them uh, people the freedom uh, to do three things. They want to have the freedom to examine any ministry. Uh, number two, to experiment with any ministry. And number three, to exercise. Uh, you know, what do you do when you exercise? You're building muscles. When you, ex you know, when you have a military exercise, you're developing skill. You're becoming more proficient at something. And so you want to give people the opportunity to try things you know, I, I didn't know that I could preach. I, I'd never done it until somebody gave me the opportunity to preach. And, and when I preached the first time, eh, it wasn't real good. But then people recognized, well, you know, it, it wasn't real good, but it was good. And we think we ought to do it again. And I, over time, I began to develop my preaching ability. And the same is true with other people. You know, a lot of people don't know they can do things until they get the opportunity to try it and then also get the opportunity to grow in their skill and, and their development. Uh, as a church, you want to provide the support that's needed for the various ministries. You want to give them material support, access to copy machines or phones or internet or a place to meet. Uh, you want to give them communication support. You want to give them the ability to... Uh, help people contact one another. You want to uh, make them a part of your uh, uh, church communication system. And you want to give them promotional support. Uh, you know, you want to uh, give them uh, access at your information table. You want to help them prepare brochures and things that explain the ministry. Uh, you want to give the ministers name tags and, and uh, identify who those people are. Uh, we like to hold a ministry fair. Uh, we do it uh, uh, once a year. Uh, Saddleback looks like they do it twice a year. But we love to have a ministry fair where we set up tables in, uh, in the church and identify all the ministries and have people at them and, and get to celebrate them. And uh, people who aren't involved in ministry can come and check everything out, try and find a place. It's a big, fun way to promote our ministries. Uh, brochures for the ministries, uh, you want to uh, celebrate them publicly from the pulpit. Whenever I'm talking about uh, teaching about things in my sermons, uh, I like to use testimonies from our ministries. I like to identify the ministries who do those things and thank them publicly from the, from the pulpit. And then we, we throw a big uh, party every year. Uh, we have what we call our Dream Team Appreciation Event. And uh, we get all 450 people who are on our dream teams. They all come to church, and we have a big, uh, we have food and and uh, and fun things for them to do. And we sing songs, and uh, they always make me do silly skits and things. I act like a, a, a goofy guy, and they laugh at me, and we laugh at one another, and we just have a great family time together uh, as those ministers. And they 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 love that. They love being appreciated. Uh, you want to offer training support. Uh, you want to uh, 
continue to uh, teach and develop their skills as they're part of, uh, of your teams, part of your ministry. Uh, number nine, you want to delegate authority with responsibility. Uh, you know, in, in our uh, church, the people who make the decisions about the ministries are the people who are doing the ministries. People who make the, children, the, the decisions about children's ministry are the people in the children's ministry. People who make the decisions about the youth are the people in the youth ministry. The people who make the decisions about the worship uh, team are the, are the worship team. And we don't have a, a, another layer of authority above them that's telling them what they should do and how to do it. Because if they're the, the ones who need to make the decisions are the ones who have their hands on ministry and are, and are doing ministry. Uh, the church is not an organization, it's an organism. It's not a business, it's a body. And so you want to build a, a climate of, of trust. And you want to let the people who have the gifts and abilities uh, function in such a way that they use those gifts and abilities to best help, uh, help the body. And so you want to give them ownership. Uh, you know, pastor, you've got to be willing to give up control. Uh, and you've got to be willing to let other people make decisions, let other people make mistakes uh, in order for, for your church uh, to grow. You don't, you don't want to be the bottleneck. And so the people respond to responsibility. The way you bring the best out of other people is you give them a challenge, you give them control, and you give them credit. And so you identify what the need is, you give them the control to be able to meet that need, and then when they succeed, you give them the credit. Here's the way it works, Pastor. When, when they succeed, they get the credit. If, if they fail, you take the blame. And if you'll do that, your people in your ministry teams will love you. They'll go to the ends of earth, earth for you. They'll do a great job for you. And they'll be as creative as the structure allows them to be. The, the, the more you try to maintain control over them, the more you, you lose your creativity. And finally, you want to always keep the vision before them. Help, help them to see that they're investing for eternity. Help them to see that they're making a difference in the growth and the life of the church. Uh, there, there's no greater cause than the kingdom of God. I make no apology for asking my people to make a commitment to the church and getting plugged in and serving on a ministry team. Because there's nothing else they're doing in their life that's going to outlast the church. Their career isn't. Their cash isn't. Truth is, not even their family is going to outlast the kingdom of God. And, uh, and so there's nothing more important than, than <coughs> pouring your life into the church. And the best thing they can do for their career and their cash and their kids is to be committed to the church. You put the kingdom of God first and everything else falls into place. And so I, I make no apology for asking for a deep commitment and helping people find out uh, what God has created them to do. You know, God's the one who made them. God's the one who's given them their shape. And God wants them to use it in the church. And, and we're just helping them to do that. Uh, there's a, a principle on vision. It's called the Nehemiah principle. And that is uh, that vision must be renewed every 26 days. Uh, you remember the story of Nehemiah? They were building the walls around the city. And it says that uh, when they got the wall halfway completed, the people became discouraged. And Joshua needed to recast the vision. And the Bible tells us that it took them 52 days to build the wall around the city. So in 26 days, the people had become discouraged. And the principle for us is, is that once a month, you've got to recast the vision. Once a month, you've got to remind people why, why we're doing what we're doing. Why it matters. And why they're an important part of it. And what the purposes are. And, uh, and why we're doing what we do. And you recast the vision. You restate the vision. Uh, monthly. And if you do that, then people will, will perform well in ministry. They'll find the ministry fulfilling and great things will, uh, will begin to happen uh, in your church. You know, I, I can just testify. I, I'd spent a number of years in traditional churches before I became a pastor. I spent five years as an associate pastor in a traditional church and uh, before I discovered the purpose-driven model. And after five years in a traditional church, frankly, I was ready to quit. I was ready to give up. Uh, it was just becoming so hard. We, we, the, 
there was just a, a facade of spirituality in our church, but behind it there was a spiritual dry rot, and people weren't growing in Christ, they weren't stepping up and serving, uh, they were expecting the pastors to do it all. Uh, I mean, it, was, it just was a lot of unhealth. And I went to the Purpose Driven Church Conference seeking some sort of help, some sort of answer, and Rick Warren laid out what a church could look like if it were balanced, if it were healthy, if it were committed to the five purposes that God has for the church. And all of a sudden, rather than being ready to quit of the church, I thought, that's the kind of church I could give my life to. And I went back to the, that traditional church and tried to help them catch a vision for what it could mean to be purpose-driven. And they weren't ready. They wouldn't do it. They'd rather stay in their old traditional way and see the church die than make the changes they needed to make in order to see it live. And, and God just spoke to me and says, you've you got to get your family out of here. And so we moved um, four or 500 miles away moved to another city, tried to plant a church. And as I said before, I just wasn't the right guy at the right time. A lot of great things happened. And a lot of great things happened in me and happened in my family and even happened in the lives of the 35 people that we had in that church. I mean, God was in that. But uh, we finally decided, okay, this really isn't as good a fit as we'd like. And then we moved to the city that I'm at now and started uh, Rockbrook Church, and, and things just uh, exploded. And we had great growth and great growth in me and in the life of my family and the life of our people. And uh, for 22 years, it has just been a joy. It's just been a roller coaster ride. You know, you get on a roller coaster, just, Whoa! that's what it's like for me to pastor my church. I just love it. It's just great fun. And uh, so I know it's hard, and you may be in a difficult situation and think, I don't know if we can do this or not. But believe me, Pastor Jeremy can help you. Purpose Driven can walk you through it. You start implementing these things. You'll begin to see some fruit from it. Your people will begin to see fruit from it. And uh, it'll, it'll, it'll start to make a difference. Uh, and when you begin to do church the way God designed the church to be, uh, it, great, great things can happen.